You have your Bibles with you this morning? Yes, Keep standing and believing. The year's not up. If you haven't experienced the hand of God, the open hand of God, then don't you dare give up. In fact, don't even stop at the end of the year. Just keep believing that the hand of God is going to manifest in your life for the rest of your life. Amen. And you say amen. amen. And when the hand of God is being experienced, then also right along with it is supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision. Praise God. Amen. I mentioned to you last Sunday, we began this new series on the prophetic word the Lord has given me for 2023. And that word is the year of the maximum, the highest level attainable. Say that with me. The year of the maximum, the highest level attainable. Mark chapter 10, I'm not going to read the whole story again. Uh, if you haven't read it, please do so. And I'm just going to focus on verse 30. Jesus had said to this man, he was a rich young ruler, Sell what you have and give to the poor. The Bible says he was grieved at that saying because he had great possessions. I wrote down something that I haven't said thus far, and I want to say it right now so I don't forget it. The measure of our trust in God will determine how tightly we hold on to what he asks us to let go of. Let me say that again. The measure of our trust in God will determine how tightly we hold on to what he asks us to let go of. When God asks you to let go of something or to give something or to sow something, he's not trying to take something from you. He's trying to get something to you. That's always his way. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. So anytime God is asking you to let go of something or to release something or to sow something, then once again, it's not he trying to take something from you. It's in, he's endeavoring to get something better to you. Amen. I remember a number of years ago, uh, we had bought this property out here, five acres to start with. And it had a little farmhouse on it that was built in 1946. The man who owned it, Mr. Lemon, I think he was about 80 years old when we purchased it from him. He had raised his family there and, uh, and then he agreed to sell it to us. And uh, Carolyn's dad and her uncles, they all came. They were all in the building business and they came and, and uh, we added on to the house it was about 1,200 square foot when we bought it. And by the time we got through adding on, it was over 3,000 square foot. And so, uh, and then we had built it kind of a ranch style. And, uh, and I had a barn built and I had stables built. I had horses then. And I was, I was living my dream. I'm a country boy. Uh, we had lived in, in town uh, prior to buying this place and, and it was a beautiful place that we owned in town but uh, I like my space I'm, I'm a country boy I was born on a farm in Mississippi and I just like my space so that's the reason we bought this place out here then after a few years uh, our ministry was leasing space at what was then known as a new facility Hewlin Towers. You can see it right off the of Chisholm Trail now. Chisholm Trail wasn't there back then. But Hewlin Towers was a new, uh, new building and we were one of some of the first tenants there. And we took almost a whole floor uh, for our ministry and part of a, another floor. And one day I was thinking about what I'm paying in lease payments. And I thought, I am paying this building off for somebody else because I'd already been there for quite a while and the, uh, the rent, the lease payment was higher than any amount we'd ever paid before. And I thought, it's time for us to have our own facilities. Why not put that money in something I own instead of help paying off something somebody else owns? And so we started looking for land. 
and uh, uh, couldn't find exactly what we were looking for at the time. I'm standing out in my front yard and I'm looking and this was all field out here back then. There was not any houses out here. We were the only house on this, on this road out here. And uh, I'm looking across the field there and Hewland ended or at the, at the, I guess, the north side of that field. And we could see land up there that was vacant. So I checked on it and couldn't believe what they were asking for it, even back then. And uh, so I thought, well, man, I must be sitting on a gold mine out here. Now, Hewland had not extended yet to where it is now in front of our ministry headquarters. That was still open field, pasture land, okay? And I thought, well, I wonder if I could just build my ministry headquarters out here. So Carol and I prayed about it, and we decided to give our property to the ministry, the house that we had just increased, you know, expanded. Uh, we gave the house, we gave the property, and kept two acres or less to build a new house on right next door. So we gave that property with the house to the ministry. Okay, everybody following me? Yes, sir. At that time, we became the largest contributor to our own ministry. <laughs> okay, because our house was valued, uh, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars, $250,000 with the land and so forth. And this is a long time ago now. So we gave the land and the house to the ministry and they tore the house down, her dad and come over and, and supervise the job, tore the house down, tore the stables down and then started building the ministry. And our house used to sit where the executive building sits now, where my office is. The stables is where the production building is now. You work in a horse stable, okay? <laughs> Used to be. And uh, the administrative building was where my horses ran around, okay? And uh, so then we began to uh, prepare to build our home, okay? Now, here in Mark 10, I'm pointing that out to show you something. In verse 30, Anyone who gives, Jesus said in verse 29, anyone who gives for his sake or the gospels shall receive in this time houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. Now, I want to help you get past something that a lot of people have a problem with. Do you mean to tell me, Brother Jerry, if I give my house away, Jesus promises me a hundred houses? How about one a hundred times better? You mean if I give my car away, he'll give me a hundred cars? How about one far better? Just, just let go of the hundredfold term for a moment. And here's the way the Lord taught me. He said, when you see hundredfold, you think maximum results and the highest level attainable. Because a lot of people choke on a hundred times. Amen. So don't even think hundredfold. Don't even think hundred times. Just think maximum results and the highest level attainable. Okay? So I would encourage you that when you sow, start focusing on the return. Focus on the return because multiplication is a theme throughout the Bible. Now God adds sometimes but when addition doesn't do it, he multiplies. Right. Amen. Yeah, that's true. Adding fish that's good. to the little boys' fishes and loaves wouldn't feed 5,000 people. 
So it took multiplication. Amen. So when God is in the adding business, all these things shall be added unto thee. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things shall be added. Now I like add addition, but I like multiplication better. Amen. Amen. So think when you see this, don't think, well, I don't think God could get me a hundred houses. Most people will never have to be concerned about that because most people never give a house away. So don't even think about it. Amen. But if you have given a house away, why not believe for one that's far better than the one you gave away? Does that help you? Yes, sir. Far better than the one you gave away. Gave away. Now we gave our home to the ministry. I call that for His sake in the Gospels. Okay, but today the home I live in is far better than the one I gave away. Not only that, but God blessed us with a second house. That's far better than anything we've ever owned before. Right. Amen? Amen? So I don't, I, don't, I don't struggle with hundred time, hundred fold. I think in terms of maximum yes. and the highest level attainable. Yes. Amen. 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 Does that help you? Yes. So let's read it that way. But he shall receive maximum and the highest level attainable. Mm. Amen. So when you think of Mark 10, 29 and 30, think of maximum and the highest level attainable. And then also I want you to notice that it says specifically in this time. In this time. We're not talking about when you get to heaven. We're talking about that in the last phrase of Mark 10, 30. And in the world to come, eternal life. In the world to come. So there are promises for believers for in the world to come. But there's also promises for believers in this time. Or as another translation says, in this present age. So you are entitled to something when you're willing to give for his sake or the gospels, you're entitled to something in this present age. Yes. And if your faith can take you to the maximum or the highest level attainable, God will honor it. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? Nothing is impossible to him that believeth. Right. Nothing is impossible to him that believeth. Amen. So can you believe for maximum? Yes. Can you believe for the highest level attainable? Yes. Yes. Amen. Now the highest level attainable to me may be different than what's attainable for you. And the only reason being is because it may be that my faith has been developed on a higher level than what your is, yours is right now. Okay, Amen. when I first started out, uh, I, I could not imagine doing things at my level of faith that Oral Roberts was doing with his level. Yeah. But I learned that I can get there because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the more I've fed my spirit the word of God, then the higher and stronger my faith level would become. My, my level of faith today is far greater than it was in 1969 when I first began this walk of faith. How I many of you can say your faith has grown? Amen. Amen. Your faith has grown. My faith has grown. So what's attainable for one person may not be attainable for another person. And there are people that have, you know, their faith is at a higher level than mine. Okay. But 
I'm dealing with what I'm capable of believing for. You deal with what you're capable of believing for. Be it unto thee according to thy faith. They didn't say be it unto thee according to Brother Jerry's faith. Be it unto thee according to your faith. Can you say amen? amen? So we're going for in 2023. I've already begun. I'm not waiting for 2023. I'm going for the maximum, the highest level attainable. Why? Because I'm a sower. I'm a giver. I live to give. I got a lot of seed out in the ground that I am waiting to, to experience a maximum and highest level attainable harvest, praise God. Glory to God. Look at somebody saying, me too, praise God. So once again, when you see the phrase hundredfold or as other translations say, hundred times, think of maximum results and the highest level attainable. Now, I want to read something to you, some fresh notes. The Barnes notes on the Bible uses the phrase in this life, uses the phrase in this life rather than now in this time. In this life. And a hundred times is translated a hundred times better. One commentary says it like this, that when you give for his sake and the gospels, you will be amply compensated. And the word amply means richly or more than adequately. More than adequately, adequately compensated. Another commentary says manifold more, meaning many times more or much, much more. Another meaning for a hundredfold is incomparably greater than what you were willing to sow incomparably greater than what you were willing to sow. Another commentary says that you will receive multiplied blessings, multiplied blessings. In God's economy, he doesn't just bless us back with what we were willing to sow. He multiplies it back to us. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse eight from the new living translation. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. He will graciously or generously provide all that you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That's maximum. Is when you have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Amen. Amen. Carolyn, I believed to be debt free for many years. And when we achieve that, then praise God, our largest household expense is our giving. We don't pay a note on a house. We don't pay a note on a car. We own everything we have. So our largest outgo is our giving. Amen. I'd I'd call that abundant life. Amen. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. The Amplified says, uh, life to its fullest. Amen. Amen. Overflowing life. I would call being able to sow and to bless others and to help prevent misfortune in the lives of others. That, that would be a good definition of living the abundant life. Can you say amen? amen? So notice you'll have plenty left over to share with others. Now, for some of you right now, your, your primary goal might be to get out of debt. Yes. How many of you believe in to get out of debt? Amen. All right. Why don't you go for that in 2023? Yes. Now, for some of you, that might be maximum results. Yes. Highest level attainable. Amen. Amen. Well, Brother Jerry, how could God get me out of debt? Oh, Same way God got me out of debt. I sowed my way out. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I sowed my way out. Amen. We sowed, when in the natural, we couldn't afford to sow, but I realized, no, that's just backwards. I cannot afford to sow. Amen. 
and we sowed. And sometimes it didn't amount to very much, but we sowed what we had and believed that God would cause it to be returned and multiplied in its return. And then we were able to sow greater sums and believe that God would multiply that. And then we were able to sow greater sums and believe that God would multiply that. He always not only provides seed, but he multiplies seed for the sowing. Can you say amen? Amen. I think that deserves a good shout to the Lord. Amen. So once again, the theme of multiplication runs throughout the Bible. What cannot be achieved by addition, God does it by multiplication. If you hold on to a seed, it accomplishes nothing. If you hold on to a seed, it accomplishes nothing. You got a seed. You can walk around saying, I got a seed. (laughs) Have you seen my seed lately? Isn't my seed beautiful? It's a precious seed. But a seed that's not sown does not accomplish anything. I've used this illustration before. Uh, I'd like to use it again if it's all right. When you walk into a seed store, you don't have to brush away all the corn all the okra, all the apples to get to the seeds that you're looking for. Why? Because the seed store is not the proper environment for sowing the seed. It's just the, it's just the place where seeds are found. Amen. Seed in your pocket accomplishes nothing. It's when it's sown. I said, it's when it's sown is when God can take it and multiply it, praise God. And gives you the right to believe for maximum results and the highest level attainable. God is able to do even with a small amount and turn it into something big. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse 10, the literal New Testament says, and the one supplying the seed to the one sowing will multiply your seed. The one supplying the seed to the one sowing will multiply your seed. See, that's my prayer. God, give me more seed for sowing. Give me more seed for sowing. Notice I'm not praying, God, just give me. Just give me, give me, give me. I'm praying for more seed for sowing because if I'm a sower, then I always have the promise of a harvest. Amen. Sowers are never without seed. It may not be in the form of money, but you do have seed. Somehow, somewhere, might have to look for it. Sometimes my sowing has been in kind words to people. That's all I had. Sometimes my sowing was a helping hand to someone. That may be all I had at the time. Sometimes my sowing was in a good deed towards someone. That may have been all I had to sow at the time. But I'm never without seed. Look at your neighbor and say, I am never without seed. seed. Amen. You, You always have seed in some form. And don't, don't limit yourself by not having money to sow at the time. That's right. Amen. That's right. Find out where there is a need and what will fulfill that need. And that need may be somebody just needs a pat on the back and a loving word, a kind word. Amen. Amen. Somebody may just need a, a helping hand. Are you still here? You always have seed to sow. And God always multiplies seed sown. God is still in the business of multiplying seed. Learn to focus on what God has promised that is coming back to you and expect it. Can you say amen? Amen. Expect it. Now, I want to go back to something here that I haven't talked about. 
And I want to make a couple of statements to you before I expound upon it. You and I were created by God to live our lives on a much higher level. To live our lives on a much higher level. The second statement I want to make to you is the highest level of life that is attainable to us is life living in fellowship with God and in fellowship with his word. That's the highest level of life that is attainable to us. Life living in fellowship with God and in fellowship with his word. That is allowing God to order your steps and allowing his word to be final authority in all the affairs of your life. That's when you tap into maximum and highest level attainable. When God is directing our steps, then as the psalmist said, he will show you the path of life. That is life at its best. When you get on that path, then it will lead to life at its best. Now I'm not saying there are no hindrances and there's no obstructions and there's no opposition. In fact, you get on that path to life, real life. Life at its best. Brace thyself. Devils will come out of the woodwork. Trying to stop you. Trying to prevent you. They're not just going to roll over and play dead just because you decided to get on the path of life. No, they're going to do everything they can to get you to just be normal again. Just, just be ordinary again. Don't rock the boat. Look at somebody and say, I can't help it. I'm a boat rocker. <laughs> Amen. So the psalmist said, show me the path of life. Life at its best. When we're on God's path of life, then Psalm 23, 6 says that goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. Hallelujah. That's not a bad way to live. When mercy and goodness are following you, all the days of your life? Hallelujah. Amen. Eric, stand up here. Your goodness. Carl, stand up here. Your mercy. Face me. Follow me. Mercy and goodness follow me all the days of my life. No matter where I go, they just follow me all the days of my life. Not only that, they try to come on me and overtake me. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Mercy and goodness. When you're on the path of life, that's God's promise. That mercy and goodness will follow you all the days of your life. I'd call that maximum living. I'd call that the highest level attainable. Can you say amen? amen? The message translation says they chase after you. They chase after you every day of your life. The passion translation says they will pursue you all the days of your life. I'd call that living in God's best. Psalm 36 verse 9 from the passion translation says the fountain of life flows from you. The fountain of life flows from you. He's the source of real life and not just an existence, but life at its best. The apostle Paul tells us that through Christ, we have the ability, according to Romans five seventeen, to reign in life. And the Amplified adds, as kings, to reign in life as kings. God is the source of life. From him spring all that constitutes life. I couldn't read my own writing there. God is the source of life. From him springs all that constitutes life. From him proceeds all that makes up true joy and happiness in life. In him we live, we move, we have our being, as the Apostle Paul said. 
Everything that makes life real comes from him. The good news Bible says you are the source of life. He provides abundant life to all in whom he showers with his grace. The new century version says you are the giver of life. Life at its best comes from him. We should be living life in its fullness. I've heard it said over the past, loving God is the prerequisite for living our best life. Never allow the love of things to become your number one pursuit in life. Always put God first. That's what enables you to experience maximum. Maximum living. Highest level attainable. Putting him first always brings the abundant life. Life at its best. We enter into life at its best by making him the center of our existence. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen? amen. All right, now. Goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. He's the source of life, the fountain of life. We have a right to live life as kings reigning in life, the Amplified Bible says. The message translation says for Romans 5, 17, extravagant life that one man, Jesus Christ, provides. Extravagant means no restraints beyond ordinary. That sound like the kind of life you'd like to live? Amen. If he's provided it for us, then why settle for anything less? Can you say amen? amen? I think all of us need to make a quality decision going into this new year that we are going to come up higher. Lift your right hand and say this with me. In the name of Jesus, in 2023, I fully intend to come up higher. The abundant life, life at its best, maximum results, the highest level attainable. It's available to me and I'm going for it in Jesus' name. And give the Lord a good shout, praise God. Amen. Now, if you're not on the path of life, then I strongly suggest you get on it as quick as you possibly can. Psalm 25 verse four says, teach me thy paths. Getting on the path of life is a result of being taught. That's what this book is for, is to teach you how to get on God's path of life. Amen. So make that your prayer. Lord, teach me thy paths. Teach me how to walk in your paths. Only you can make the decision to get on the path of life. I can't make that for you. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. So notice choosing life is something that we as individuals must do ourselves. He's not going to choose it for us. He just lays it out and says, this is what life at its best looks like. Choose it. Amen. Do you want it? <laughs> then choose it. Amen. Amen. Say this with me. Today, Today I, choose I choose life. I choose the life that God desires for me. No longer just existing. No longer just barely getting by but life at its fullest, life at its best. I choose the life that Jesus provided for me through his shed blood, the abundant life. I will not accept anything less. In Jesus' name, so be it. So be it. Look at your neighbor and say, so be it. Amen. Hallelujah. That's, that's the beginning is you have to make a decision. You have to make the choice to live it. Amen. Now, from this moment on, after that declaration of faith, watch your mouth. <laughs> I know you've heard it before. Watch your mouth. I can't stress to you enough that your words matter. 
A lot of times people fail to get into God's best simply because they have become their own worst enemy with how they talk, what's coming out of their mouth. Let me remind you that the book of Proverbs says, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 13, 3, he that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. The Amplified Bible says, he that guards his mouth. The message translation says, careless talk ruins everything. On another note, be wise in who you hang out with. Not only do your words matter, but who you run with matters. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Evil communications corrupt, corrupt good manners. The cross reference in my Bible says corrupts good habits. Another translation says, don't let yourselves be poisoned by the loose talk of others. Don't let yourself be poisoned by the loose talk of others. So the bottom line is, if you truly want to enjoy maximum results and reach the highest level attainable, then be selective about what comes out of your mouth and be selective about who you run around with. Because not everybody sees what you see. Not everybody's believing for what you're believing for. Not everybody embraces your dream. Amen? Amen. So make sure that you pal around with, run with, associate with people of like precious faith. Yeah. Amen. My best friends are people who believe for maximum results. Yeah. They believe for the highest level attainable. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now I can be around unbelievers. I've learned how to be around doubt and unbelief. I can put a smile on my face, look right in, right in their eye and never hear another word they say. How do you do that, Brother Jerry? Well, some of you do it every Sunday. <laughs> Never hear another word we say. Man, I hope the Baptists don't beat us to the cafeteria. No, you can learn to just smile and be friendly and not listen to a thing they say. Just turn a deaf ear to it. Amen? Just walk away saying, well, that may be what they believe but it's not what I believe. What I believe, I'm having maximum results. I'm going for the highest level attainable, whether they go with me or not. Bless them, Lord. Help them understand. Give them insight and revelation. But as far as me and my house, we're going for the maximum. We're going for the highest level attainable, praise God. Can you say amen? So if you want to enjoy the maximum and the highest level attainable, Become selective about what comes out of your mouth and be selective about those in whom you run with. Amen. Amen. Whether you believe it or not, it does matter. Don't run with people who are content. Listen to this. Don't run with people who are content to stay as they are. Some people are just satisfied. They're just satisfied with where they are. Why would you be satisfied when the Bible says there's so much more? There's so much more that is attainable. Amen? I, I heard the Lord say as I was studying this and making my notes, I heard Him say, tell the people, it's time to launch out into the deep. It's time to launch out into the deep. That's what He told Peter. Launch out into the deep. That's where maximum results are and that's where the highest level attainable is. The deep. Listen to this, Psalm 107, verse 23 and 24. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. Notice people that are willing to get out of the boat, get off of the shores of life. These are the people that see the wonders of the Lord 
and the works of the Lord. Those that are willing to get out of the boat and those that are willing to get off the shores of life. The Passion Translation say, these are the people that see breathtaking wonders. The Message Translation say, this, these are the people that see God in action. How many of you want to see God in action? Praise God. Remaining on the shores of life will not allow you to experience the highest levels attainable. Doing what you're only capable of doing in your own might and in your own strength will not take you there. I'll say it again. Doing what you're only able to do in your own might and in your own strength will not take you to the maximum. Not take you to the highest levels attainable. And sowing what you think you can only afford won't take you there either. You have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone if you want to experience the maximum. If you want to experience the highest level attainable. Comfort zones for many people are areas from which they seldom stray. Anybody in here have relatives who live in very small towns? How many of you have ever asked them to come see you in Dallas or Houston or San Antonio? Oh, dear God, we couldn't go there. The traffic is unreal, we hear. Most of them never even been out of town, but they heard the traffic is unreal. We wouldn't dare leave our house. Like one guy wrote to his relatives. We've heard that, that most accidents occur within one mile of your house. Just wanted to let you know we've moved. <laughs> relatives, I have relatives that they wouldn't dare come to Fort Worth. And Fort Worth's not near as bad as Dallas or Houston. But they wouldn't dare come to Fort Worth. Why? It's too big. There's too much traffic. You know, it's like that verse that's so funny in Proverbs. There is a line in the street. We shall be eaten. You could run. <laughs> you could hide. Just because there's a line in the street does not mean you will be eaten. That's ignorance gone to seed, as Brother Hagin would say. Oh, there's too much traffic in Fort Worth. Uh, why don't y'all come see us in Arkansas? <laughs> why don't y'all come see us in Missouri? You know, little, little small communities wouldn't dare branch out. They wouldn't leave their comfort zone. And guess what? Their world is very small. Their world is very small. Do any of you have relatives who still believe that a man never went to the moon, that was all staged in Arizona somewhere? <laughs> Amen. I had relatives like that. Carolyn had relatives like that. They didn't believe it. They still don't believe that a man went to the moon. That it was, it was all staged in Arizona somewhere. They live in a very small world. But listen to this. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 11. This is how you enlarge your world. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24. There is that scattereth or soweth and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tends to poverty. In other words, when you're withholding, when you should be sowing, it's going to lead to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Now, the uh, message translation says it this way. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. So if you're constantly withholding when you should be giving, then your world is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. But when you're sowing generously, then your world gets larger and larger and larger. My world today is far larger 
than it was when I first started in 1969. Amen. 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 And I'm very grateful for all that God has done, all that God has blessed me with, and all that God has done where our ministry is concerned. I mean, I never dreamed when I came into this in 1969 that our ministry would be known around the world. Amen. Around the world. Amen. I can't get to all the places I'm, in, I'm, I'm invited to preach. As we say in Texas, who'd have thunk it? <laughs> my world has got larger and larger and larger. In fact, my books and my resources have gone to nations I've never even been to. Amen. My world has got larger and larger and larger. And it's because I've been a faithful sower. I started where I, where I was at. And it wasn't much but I was consistent. Look at your neighbor and say, oh, that's the key. <laughs> consistent. See, people that, people that don't give or withhold or they think they can't afford to give. Now, I'm not telling you to, to give, you know, your house rent or give, uh, you know, your car note. But you do have something to give so that you can demonstrate consistency. Once again, if there's nothing else but your favorite faith building book, bless somebody with it. That's a seed. Oh, I couldn't do that. That's my favorite one. Well, what good would it be giving somebody one that you didn't like? You'll wind up with a library full of books you don't like because every seed will be multiplied. Amen? Like the time that uh, Brother Copeland and I flew to Birmingham, Alabama in his little Cessna 310. And he said, Jerry, we need to go early because God's dealing with me about television and I don't know how to do it and not only that, I don't have the money to, to launch out into it. He said, so we're going to go early and we're going to spend a couple of days in prayer and get the wisdom of God. So we flew to Birmingham in his little Cessna 310 and uh, got to Birmingham, checked in the hotel, went to dinner that night. And then he said, now be in my room in the morning at 6 a.m. and we're going to pray. And so I went to his room. Now this is the first time he had invited me to be involved in his prayer time. So I remembered the scripture, watch and pray. I thought, I'm going to let him pray and I'm going to do the watching and I'm going to take notes on how he prays. Okay. How he gets the wisdom of God. I was always taking notes. That's the reason 30 years later, I wrote the book in the footsteps of a prophet. And in that book is a lot of things I learned from him just watching and observing. Okay. And so, uh, we got up that morning and started praying. We and I, and I watched how he prayed. He, he started off, and we didn't have a large hotel room, but he started walking the floors just praying in the Spirit. Had his Bible in his hand. Walking the floors, praying in the Spirit. I got right in behind him, and I just had my Bible in my hand. Didn't know where we was looking. Just had my Bible in my hand just like he did. He said, follow me as I follow the Lord, Paul said. In this case, I'm following Brother Copeland as he follows the Lord. So I got my Bible in my hand. I'm just walking behind him and he's praying in the spirit. I'm praying in the spirit. And in a little while he'd sit down and he'd read a scripture to me. Now here's what, here's what Jesus said, Jerry. And he'd read that scripture. I would mark that scripture. Then we'd get up and we'd pray in the spirit some more. Just walking around praying in the spirit. Uh, it's like the Pied Piper. I mean, I'm just following in his footsteps, praying in the spirit. And then he said, all right, well, let's, let's, uh, let's take a shower and go have some breakfast and then we'll come back and do this again later. So we did that for about two or three days. And the last day, uh, when we got through praying, I went to my room. And when I put the key in the door, I heard my phone ringing in the, in the room there. I answered his brother Copeland. He said, get back down here as quick as you can. I just heard from the Lord. I thought, wow, praise God. So we went, I went back down there. He said, I know how we're going to do this. 
I said, how? He said, I'm going to sow my airplane. I'm going to sow my airplane into another man's ministry. Now, my first thought was, because <laughs> I'm, I'm real young in this. I mean, I'm learning, see. My first thought was, well, how are we going to get home? <laughs> and he perceived my thoughts. <laughs> he said, I know what you're thinking. How are we going to get home? He said, I'm going to fly it home, ding a -ling. And then we'll give it to him. I thought, yeah, I knew that. No problem. I knew that. Hallelujah. That's when I got the nickname ding a -ling. And I don't want anybody calling me that. Only Kenneth Copeland could call me that. And then he said, uh, I'm going to call the man I'm going to give it to right now. And let's see how he reacts because he'd been believing for an airplane. And the man's name was Joe Nay. Joe was a minister in Arlington, Texas, very, very close friend of ours. So he called Joe Nay. He said, Joe, are you sitting down? He said, yeah, I'm sitting down. He said, the Lord just told me to give you my airplane. And Joe went to screaming and a shouting, dropped the phone on the floor, went to running around in the living room, I guess, and just a hollering and a shouting and Brother Copeland holding the phone out like this. And he said, uh, Joe, uh, I'm going to give you my airplane, but it needs some work on it. And I'm going to pay for that work to be done before I give it to you. So as soon as Jerry and I get back home and I get the work done, I'll, I'll call you or I'll fly it over to wherever you want to keep it. And the airplane is yours. It's yours right now. I just want to take care of these things before I put it in your hands. And Joe went shouting again. And I thought, if you're going to give it away, then why spend more money on it? Why don't you let him do the work? And he perceived my thoughts again. He said, I know what you're thinking. If I'm going to give it away, why don't I let Joe put the money into it? Ding-a-ling. I said, oh. He said, I don't want a plane coming back to me that I have to spend a ton of money on before I can even fly it. I want to give it first class and I want to receive a first class airplane. Every seed produces after its own kind. I said, yeah, hallelujah, I knew that. Glory, glory. See, I'm learning. I'm learning. This is all in the book, in the footsteps of a prophet. These are things I learned in the early days that got me where I am today, okay? And praise God, I say this to the glory of God and not bragging on me, but I've been able to give nine airplanes away myself over the last 50 years, praise God. Amen. So, every seed produces after its own kind. Notice the world of the generous gets larger and larger and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. When you're refusing to give, when you know in your heart you should be giving, then you not only limit yourself, you limit God. Sowing is God's way of entering into the maximum. It's God's way of experiencing the highest level attainable. Now go with me to Psalm 112. Psalm 112. Are you receiving this morning? I'm speaking from over 50, almost 54 years of experience. I'm not a novice at this. I know what I'm doing. Hallelujah. And it works. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the reason I'm going to keep on doing it. Now, look at verse 5 in Psalm 112. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees desire upon his enemies. He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. Now notice in verse five, once again, 
This is a man who shows favor to others. This is a man who lends to others. This is a man who disperses. This is a man who gives to the poor. Sounds like to me, this man lives to give. Amen? He lives to give. The Amplified says, it is well with this man who deals generously. He has distributed freely. It is well with this man because he deals generously and he has distributed freely. The Passion Translation says, I love this. Life is good to the one who is generous and charitable. Oh, you missed a wonderful opportunity to say amen. Life is good to the one who is generous and charitable. They will not live in fear or dread of what may come. Never stingy, always generous to those in need. They live lives of influence. Hallelujah. Notice this person is tapping into the maximum. This person is reaching the highest level attainable. And then notice in verse three, wealth and riches shall be in his house. Because this man is a generous giver. This man is always looking for opportunities to sow. He's always looking for opportunity to show favor toward other people. Then the Bible says, wealth and riches shall be in his house. The Amplified says, prosperity will be in his house. And the Passion says, great blessings will fill his house. Great blessings will fill his house. So it doesn't sound like to me this is a man who is withholding, nor is it a man who is barely getting by. Don't accept the lie that you just can't afford to give. The truth is you can't afford not to. The truth is you can't afford not to. Now, I, I'm, I'm picking up on some of your thinking. I'm perceiving some of your thoughts. He's just preaching this so we'll give a good offering this morning. Well, if that's what you think, keep your offering. I'm preaching this so you'll receive a greater harvest. Amen. You do what you want to where your offering is concerned. Keep it if you want to. You're foolish if you do after what you've just seen from the word. But I, my motive is not so that I can get your offering. In fact, it'd be all with me if we didn't even receive the tithes and offerings this morning. Because I know from previous experience, God will make it up to us somewhere. He always does. Amen. So I'm not preaching this to try to get you to give an offering. I'm preaching this so I can try to get you in position to receive a greater harvest. Hallelujah. Amen. So don't accept the lie that you just cannot afford to give. Start where you are, even if it's small, but be consistent. That is the key. Be consistent. Everybody say consistent. A lot of Christians never enter into the realm of the maximum, nor do they ever experience the highest level attainable simply because they are so inconsistent. Inconsistent. Amen. How many of you love working out? <laughs> Betty, I'm going to lay hands on you. I mean, you know, I love it when I finally decide to do it. But it's that getting to the place to decide to do it that's hard sometimes. Can I get an amen, baby? Okay. How many of you overate at Thanksgiving? How many of you went to bed feeling miserable? How many of you got up in the middle of the night and ate some more pie? And you were miserable? Dear God, I can't eat another bite. 
<laughs> like we were down at Jesse and Kathy's in New Orleans. And they took us to Mr. B's, which is my favorite restaurant. Mr. B's, great Cajun food. They have this gumbo they call gumbo yaya. Oh, it's good. My goodness, we're going to have it in heaven. And uh, so they took us down there. And if you want good Cajun food, go with a Cajun that knows what to order. And Jesse, I mean, he ordered everything. And we ate, and we ate, and we ate. And I was so full, I couldn't hardly walk. We got to the car, I just flopped down. And I said, man, I ate too much. He said, Jerry, I'm going to take you to Gambino's. I said, Gambino's? Sound like mafia people. <laughs> and Jesse knows mafia people. <laughs> I said, Gambino. He said, they make the best pastries in New Orleans. I said, Jesse, I can't eat anymore. He said, no, you got to call. You got to try these. You got to try that. I said, Jesse, I can't eat anymore. He said, no, you just got to try one. I said, Jesse, I can't eat another bite. He said, these are the best coconut macaroons you've ever eaten in your life. And he stopped at Gambino's when I told him no. And he brought out a box full of them, like a dozen of them. They're this thick and this big around. He said, try this. I said, I can't eat another bite, Jesse. I don't know where I'd put it. He said, just try a bite. I said, okay, I tried a bite. Give me that thing. <laughs> I consumed that with a gusto of a hound dog. I mean, dear Lord, it was good. Now, they're in the habit of bringing me a box of Gambino's coconut macaroons. They're so good. But was I consistent in my decision not to eat anymore? No. I consumed that so fast you wondered where the wrapper went. Consistency. That's, that's the missing ingredient in the lives of most Christians. Consistency. Now, I'm not saying that I'm, cons I'm, the, I'm the ultimate example of consistency in every area of my life. Now, there's a couple of things I'm missing. <laughs> there are some things I'm very consistent at. But then there's some other things that, you know, I've got to get my act together. I'm just being honest. Look at your neighbor and say, and there's a couple of things I need to get my act together as well. <laughs> you know, why, why would you build a gym next door to your study in your home? There's a gym next to my study. You have to walk past it to even get to the study. There was a purpose for doing that. So I would go to my gym because I didn't like going to gyms, you know, I, I, I was a member of a gym and a lot of times it looked like just a pickup place. Men trying to pick up women, women trying to pick up men and a lot of goofy things going on. I even caught people in the showers doing ugly things. So I wanted my own gym so I don't have to deal with that. So Carolyn built me a gym in my house, her house, my gym. <laughs> I got a gym right next to my study. You have to walk past it to get to the study. And when we first built it, 30 something years ago, oh, I was consistent. But now I walk by there and see all that stuff. Way. <laughs> and go to the study. Inconsistency. Okay. And I keep telling myself, now I'm going to be 76 next month. I keep telling myself, I haven't voiced it to anybody else. It's the first time I've voiced it to anybody else. <laughs> it, it's sticking in my throat. <laughs> when I turn 76, I'm going to get in the best shape of my life. Yes, Amen. Amen. I'm getting back in my gym. I even have a gym down at our river house. It's next to the best bedroom. 
You have to walk past it to even get to the bathroom. But in the name of Jesus, I am saying it and I believe I can have what I say and the Holy Spirit's gonna help me be consistent. I'm getting back in the gym when I turn 76. Not before. Because <laughs> my birthday is Christmas Eve. I don't wanna miss Christmas. All that good food for Christmas. We can wait. It's only a few more days. But when I turn 76, after my birthday, it's back in the gym, Jerry goes. I'm gonna be consistent. Hallelujah. Amen. Because I know consistency is the key to all success. Amen. It's the key to success in reaching maximum and the highest level attainable. It's the one thing that will set you apart from the rest of the crowd. Hallelujah. You received that this morning? Yes. Glory to God. Our year for the maximum and the highest level attainable. Come on, let's lift our hands and thank God for it. Father, I pray that something I've said this morning will help people, inspire people, and, and cause us all to, to maintain the, the words that we spoke earlier in this service. That we absolutely refuse to accept anything less from your best, the best life possible. The highest level attainable. Maximum results in everything that we do. In the name of Jesus. And let me see the hands of all the sowers in here. Father, I pray over every person with their hand raised. And I'm assuming they are telling me they're consistent sowers. And I'm praying over each and every one of them that their consistency is going to produce the maximum results coming into this coming year. And it's going to produce them being able to reach the highest level attainable financially in every area of their lives in the name of Jesus. Satan, we forbid you to hinder their harvest. You take your hands off God's people's money. Take your hands off of their harvest in the name of Jesus. Our harvest is crying out for us and we cry out for it. We say to our harvest, come to us in Jesus' name. I believe our harvest is saying, let me go and allow me to get into the hands where I rightfully belong. In Jesus' name, and I believe you're causing a divine, uh, a, a divine appointment between our harvest and us in the name of Jesus, and we give you praise for it. Come on, give the Lord your best shout this 